seven days of creation, but then they have another creation story with Adam and Eve. So you're, a lot of you are familiar with the Adam and Eve story. Um, and at one point, you know, Adam is lonely, so God puts him into a deep sleep uh, to create a woman. What it doesn't mention in the Bible is what happened right after that. And that is when Adam woke up, God said to him, Adam, here's what I want you to do. I want you to cross the river. And Adam says, what's a river? And so God explained it to him. And he says, and I want you to walk to this beautiful garden. He says, what's, what's a beautiful garden? So he explained it to them. He says, and in that garden, you will find a woman, a companion for you. And he says, well, what's a woman or a companion? So God explained it to Adam. And he says, and that woman, I'd like you to be fruitful and multiply. And Adam's like, okay, what's that? And so God explained it to him. So Adam set on in his trek across the river to the garden, and he finds the beautiful woman Eve. And five minutes later, he's coming back across the river and asks God, what's a headache? <laughs> <laughs> that was edited out of the Bible, I think. <clears throat> It's said that 98% of us come from dysfunctional family systems. I guess that 2% is supposed to, for us to, supposed to hold out hope. But one of the challenges is, is that it seems to be part of our path to have weird stuff happen to us, you know, as we establish a worldview and uh, what, what, you know, what life is all about. So it'd be silly to condemn having been in a dysfunctional system because it made us who we are. And then those other 2%, well, you know. <laughs> but there is kind of an evolution of things. And I, and I love in the Bible how often it says it came to pass. You know, it didn't come to stay. Uh, you know, though I walk through the valley of death, I set up camp and stay there. It's like, no, it's just, you know, you, you keep on moving through it. <clears throat> But one stage really does build upon the other. And I want to kind of explore three stages of relationships that all of us at least have encountered, if not experienced. Uh, the first stage is codependency. That's when, you know, I depend upon another person to defend my worth or my identity. <laughs> Carl and I met a unity minister who one of his jokes was, I'm not codependent, am I, honey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's kind of our default setting, you know, as we're born, you know, we have to depend upon other people, you know, as, as, a, as a baby. So that's, that becomes our modus operandi. You know, we, we, we find that we can manipulate others to get what it is we need. So that's what we do. But there's this general theme as we start to establish ourselves as being codependent that we have to have somebody else that we're incomplete. You know, that we're, that we're, that we're, uh, we have a void in our lives. Um, and it's celebrated, of course, in popular music and movies. In fact, I want to show you a video clip um, from the movie Jerry Maguire with Renee Zellweger and Tom Cruise. Looks like Renee's deeply thinking about something here. <laughs> We live in a cynical world. A cynical world. We live in a cynical world. And we work in a business of tough competitors. I love you. You complete me. And I'm just. Yeah, just shut up. Just shut up. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. Of course, those are two movie lines that have become part of our vernacular. You complete me. You had me at hello. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's beautiful. I mean, and it's part of rom romance. But there's also that sense, like I say, if you're walking around with a hole or, you know, in ourselves or, you know, that we're a partial person, 
uh, it, you know, it affects everything we do. <clears throat> it is just done in con- unconsciously, you know, for in early on in our life. We, we figure out how to work the system. And, uh, of course, our parents figure out how to work the system with, with us as we're growing up. And, there's, and here again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way that a path that we have to walk. Uh, but what I found in my own life, if you haven't found it in years, is that behavior affects all relationships, not just our family relationships, but our intimate relationships, our work relationships. I know for me, um, <clears throat> you know, my dad was kind of the disciplinarian and my mom was the person who could talk some sense to the disciplinarian. <laughs> and what I found was early on, especially when I was working in radio, TV, news, that every place that I worked had... I at least projected that archetype onto it, that you know, there was the boss who was hard to talk to, and then there was the, the, the person who could talk some sense to the boss, you know, like the second in command. And you know, it wasn't until you know, many years later that I uh, thought, wow, I mean, just to, <laughs> to see that pattern in each of those places that I didn't see consciously earlier in my life. But uh, so it affected what I did, you know, and in my first marriage, too. Um, you know, as I was uh, with another woman named Bev for nine years, long before I met Carla, and you know, there was very much that sense of, you know, you complete me. You know, I need to, I need to have your approval to feel that I'm a whole person. Yeah, I don't complete you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I plead the fifth. <laughs> But we have this illusion that we need to be in control. Well, let me break it, to break the truth. Yes. Sir. How many things are we really in control of? You know, uh, but we do have divine order in our lives. We declare that, yeah, there'll be a proper or- order or sequence of events that'll happen, you know, so that, that, that our highest good can unfold. So we figure out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we embrace it, and uh, here again, like I say, it, it always comes to pass as we move on. Okay, so we've got codependency. Then the second stage is independence. You know, that's when the codependent relationship is, falls apart in some way, either intentionally or non, non-intentionally. You know, we see this in, in teenagers who, you know, kind of strike out to differentiate themselves from their parents. Uh, you know, but we see it in other people, too, in their 20s. And here again, that can happen in a work environment or a family environment or an intimate relationship. <clears throat> we get to this point of like, ah, that's it, I'm done with this, and we move on. But... Um, if we're smart at that point, we'll start to really explore who we really are. I know, um, you know, when I did go through that divorce and then met Carla, you know, we had, uh, you know, we talked about what we believed in God, and Carla had a conversation with her hairdresser like a couple of days later, and that person went to Unity in Chicago, and that's how we discovered Unity in Chicago. So uh, as I started to explore, that concept of like, I'm a co-creator of everything that's happened in my life. It's like, wow, you mean I'm accountable for all of that? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was part of, the, part of what was going on. So our self-confidence begins to grow. We, we learn how to develop uh, healthy friendships. Uh, but then we're smitten with, with uh, maybe another intimate relationship. Uh, and, of course, in the early stages of that particular relationship, you know, everything is wonderful until we start noticing things that bother us. You know, we notice things, and we start to build a case <laughs> against that person. Um, and so, you know, and then we'll finally get to the point where we're like, ah, that's it, I'm out of here again. And after doing this several times, we start to realize the only common denominator through all those relationships was me. You know, so what's... What's going on? Why am I projecting this codependency once situation once again? And that's where we seem to go, be go, going back and forth. You know, codependency, independence, codependency, independence. We get to that point, though, where we're finally tired of that and we're willing to move forward. And so when I reached that stage, you know, and met Carla and started playing some of those games early on with Carla, uh, the, you know, I, I found a therapist, you know, to talk to and kind of sort all of this stuff out. And then, of course, like I said, I discovered unity. So the spiritual aspect came in and the understanding, wow, I don't need to be more spiritual. I'm already a spiritual being having a human experience. 
So when we're ready and we open our minds to the divine mind, we start to get those, you know, those ideas. And we start to follow our intuition rather than our thinking and feeling nature. In the Gospel of Matthew, 7th chapter, there's a story of the, of the narrow path, or in some translations it's the narrow gate. But um, Jesus says, So whatever you wish the others would do, do so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Take the narrow path, for the wide path is easy that leads to destruction, and those who travel it are many. For the path is narrow, and the way is hard, and that leads to life, and those who find that are few. So the narrow path can lead to that kingdom of heaven. You know, and in, and in Bible symbolism, there are times where, talk to, where they talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus will talk about these two. The kingdom of God is that absolute realm of spirit that's always there, never changes. Is, is absolute. And then we have the relative realm, the kingdom of heaven. And in that we have an ever-growing awareness that we're a spiritual being having a human experience. We start to experience wisdom, understanding, harmony, and peace. And it's challenging because there's an aspect of human nature where we want to belong with the crowd. And yet, if the crowd is on the wide path and we need to take the more narrow path, it feels very hard early on. But as time goes on, what I discovered is it was much more enriching, and it really did allow me to be part of something much larger than myself expressing in the world. So it begins with a willingness to love and accept ourselves just as we are, with all of our flaws, all of our quirks. Now, many feel weird with that whole concept of love myself, love myself. And the reason is... There's a difference between loving myself, which could actually lead to narcissism, and loving the true nature of who I am. Knowing that, that, that I am a spiritual being having a human experience, embracing that Christ consciousness, as it says in you know, many of Unity's aspects. If we understand that, then it's very easy to accept ourselves and to recognize that everything that's happened to us has happened for a reason. Jesus had some more advice when he was being um, one of the um, Pharisees that asked him, you know, well, there are ten commandments, which one of them is the greatest? And so um, he, Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The greatest power in the universe is love. And that's one of our major purposes in the world, is to be willing to express that love, you know, to open our heart, to trust, allow it to be in and through us. So we open to our, again, to the divine guidance, allow our mind to be open to that divine mind that's always there and always connected to us. It's just we tend to close the door often. So we allow those divine ideas to pour forth. Which ones are right for us to express? We know intuitively what that is. So what I found you know, in my life is rather than trying to find Ms. Wright, I had to be someone who Ms. Wright would want to be with. Each of us has something that we've formed called our ego. And this ego carries forth all of the programming or worldview that we have. So when we do make a shift in our life, that ego gets nervous. It gets that feeling of like, oh God, you know, uh, I'm going to be killed off or die here. When in reality, we have to recognize that we can coach it. It tries to talk us out of changing when we say, well, no, wait a minute. This is a much better idea. This is a much better way of living. Let me you know, give you that vision so that you can carry forth with that, you know, almost our unconscious mind as we move forward in the world. And then that allows us to go to that third stage, and that third stage is interdependence. So we've got codependent, independent, and then interdependent. So rather than 
feeling like we're a part of a person or that we have a, an H-O-L-E hole in ourselves. We have two whole people, W-H-O-L-E, <laughs> um, <clears throat> being willing to come together and to form a third thing, a relationship. We're no longer afraid of intimacy because we're not losing ourselves in having that intimacy. And I know in, in, when I do a wedding ceremony, there are a lot of wedding ceremonies they'll have where you've got two candles and then one candle. And they'll say, you know, each candle represents these two souls, and you light these candles. And then they'll have the person light the third candle, and then they'll blow out the other two candles. But when I do a ceremony, I, don't, I tell them not to blow out the other two candles because you're not giving up who you are to, to, you know, to, for this. But it is up to each of us to nurture that intimate relationship. So it is a third entity. We just need to tend to the fire, tend to the flame. And that allows us to be able to go through the challenges. So when things do get challenging, we essentially have made a pledge to each other that we're going to stick around. We're going to work this out. We're going to talk it through. And that is truly what a holy communion is all about. A holy relationship just allows us to heal our stuff from our childhood. To bring out the best in each other, as I often say. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and put up this week's takeaways. Oh, and I got to hand it to, uh, to Duncan, too. I had, uh, you know, usually I just hand him the slides that I'm going to use for the morning, and I actually forgot to bring them today. <laughs> so, but I had printed them out uh, so, that, uh, so that he was able to recreate them. So, so thank you, Duncan, for putting in the extra work today. So we've got these three stages of relationships, which, of course, you've got in your handout. Codependence, when I depend upon another person to define my worth. Independent comes when a codependent relationship drops away. And then interdependent, when two whole people, wholeness, choose to be in a relationship. We're no longer afraid of the intimacy because we don't lose our individuality, but we do form a bond through the creation of that relationship. Jesus had some more advice about this in the Gospel of Matthew 18th chapter, 19th verse. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where the two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. So this is not just advice about how to pray, it's an advice about how to be. We'll close with a two and a half minute video from Steve Hartman of the CBS Evening News. <laughs> 